diabetes, we can see it goes up to like 26% here, less than 40, that's the lowest one. So if I let this play, you'll see how over time these two measures have changed. So starting at 94, 95. if you were born to turn red, huh? <laughs> no, my mom got diabetes on my brother. <laughs> you mean pregnant? Yeah. I think that's not right. But um, she, stayed, she stayed having Three it. Oh. Um, so the James is certain that she did first. And her... Uh, new life, new life. Just recently doing the video. I don't know real, though. <laughs> we're going to pass when I was born. Oh, wait, he did. <laughs> Can you really think? But, um, and then here is some time. Watching that was for really high test level, like, oh, like oh, any second, like, she couldn't um, pass away, like, due to, like, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. the doctor could tell her that she was in the house and she was in the bed. And they showed her, like, that she's literally in the bed. So. Were she looking at her and happy or what? So, no, she got for, like, 20 like, years, we went from a pretty good, even though not great, she was average BMI. Yeah, she wouldn't be sure. Diabetes is sore, so we're now at almost 10% of us have diabetes. Mm -hmm. I'll post these as well for your enjoyment. Really? Oh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. in October, I pushed her to the gym. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're pushing her like that? <laughs> I rolled it. <laughs> <laughs> but pretty much. Because she was very um, gym shy or whatever. Mm -hmm. like, dude, like, they're all here. Like, this time. So and now we're all there. there. And I know many of you are thinking of recurring medicine. And you guys, yeah, I don't want to tell really you how many stories we hear. Because mm -hmm. we have a diabetes lab of people with diabetes going to see the doctor and the doctor's just not knowing what to do. We yeah. had somebody um, we know end up in the hospital with diabetic 2 acidosis, one of the complications of diabetes. And every day, new doctor, new treatment plan, because they just didn't really know what to do and they wouldn't agree with each other. And so she was put in a hospital and had to stay there much longer because the doctors didn't have like this good grasp of what to do with her. All right, so diagnosis of diabetes. Like I said, diabetes means your blood sugars are too high. And so normally in humans, Blood sugars are between 70 to 120 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, a deciliter is a tenth of a liter, so about a tenth of a quart. What is that? Not the most ounces, but four ounces, three and a half ounces, something yeah. like that. Um, doesn't really matter. But the normal value is 70 to 120 milligrams. And then we have several criteria that we use to determine when we call you as having diabetes. So if at any point during the day, without having fasted, right? Fasting would bring your blood sugars down. But just a random non-fasted blood glucose, if that is at 200, we suspect you'll have uh, diabetes because it really shouldn't go there. This range is already including you eating something or having a soda and your body putting the sugars back down. So it will rise from the baseline, insulin does its job, glucose goes down, and that's the normal fluctuation. You're not always at 70 or always at 120. Your blood sugars fluctuate a little bit. But they really should never make it up to uh, 200. And then if you fast, they made pregnant women do this, so I had to go through this several times. They want to make sure that you as a mom don't have diabetes. So they let you, while you're trying to grow this baby, fast the whole night and don't have breakfast. And they bring him in. And if your blood sugar at that point is above 126, that is a serious indication of having diabetes. And then what they do to you, they give you this orange-colored, nasty drink that has about 75 grams of glucose in it, and you have to chug it down really quickly. 
And then they keep measuring your blood glucose. And if at two hours, uh, you're still elevated, you haven't taken care of this big bulk of glucose that you took in, that's also another good indication. So these, as you can see, are all sort of um, direct measurements, things that happen now in your body. We're also trying to include this sort of long-term memory that's present in your body. And that is the hemoglobin that is glycated. So where the sugars that were floating around have attached themselves to your hemoglobin. And the higher the sugar, the higher this percentage of hemoglobin molecules that has a sugar group on them. And just by following people over a long time and comparing that to what their hemoglobin was, um, <clears throat> they can now say, predict based on what your percentage is. So here's this table. I'll repost these, and you don't have to remember the numbers, but it's to, to illustrate. So if a small percentage of your hemoglobin has been glycated, that means the A1C levels are high uh, or low, then um, you have a fairly good blood sugar on average, and this increases rapidly if you have, on average, very high blood sugars. And this is nice, right? Red blood cells don't have a nucleus. They don't have a long lifespan. They live for about three months. So this will tell you over the course of about three months what has happened to your blood sugars, because they were alive that time, and over that time they were able to accumulate this much glycation. And so that's not really a, a moment measurement, but it gives you some history. It's not part of the official diagnosis strategy, but people really, uh, people with diabetes would know their A1Cs. Okay, different types of diabetes. We already mentioned type one, type two. Type one diabetes is a small part of people that have diabetes, about 10%. Um, <laughs> They have diabetes because their body can no longer make enough insulin. And that is because their own immune system erroneously thinks that beta cells are bad and starts killing them. We don't really know what, what triggers that. There's some thinking that if you have a gastrointestinal infection, then this might go to your beta cells. Now your immune system is looking at beta cells, and some of those immune cells might start to think that all beta cells are bad, right? And so they start destroying them all. It usually takes a long time. This is a slow process. And by the time that you are diagnosed, um, you probably have lost like 90% of your beta cells. 10% is left, and, and that's kind of that cutoff of at which point the beta cells that are still there are no longer able to manage. This, um, even though it's kind of a, a slow process, when you present with type 1 diabetes, this is often with sky-high glucoses, extreme thirst, like kids begging for water um, at night because they are so thirsty. Um, and often is diagnosed in children. It used to be called juvenile diabetes because of this. Um, but anyone, even us, we are still at risk of getting type 1 diabetes. Um, so if you get it right now, that probably means that you have had this immune response for a while, and maybe you knew it wasn't as strong as it was in a kid diagnosed at 18 months, right? So that means you also see that. Type 2 mm -hmm. diabetes, that is where the bulk of the people with diabetes are. So this is insulin resistance. This has to do with our lifestyle. Um, insulin resistance means insulin is circulating through your body but it needs to be present at much higher levels before your cells are taking off the glucose. Um, because your body has stopped listening. It could be that the cells downregulated the receptor, it could be um, many different things, but it happens to happen a lot when there's a high fat um, reserve in your body. Somehow the fat interferes with the function of the receptor. If you just happen to be a person who doesn't make a lot of insulin, there's no immune destruction, but you also have too little insulin to cover the needs of your body. So some people with type 2 diabetes do not um, respond to this picture that you might have in your head now of somebody who's morbidly obese. They have a very normal BMI, and especially in uh, some parts of the world, it happens to be that if people gain weight, it sits in the wrong spot. So it might be belly weight, 
which is worse than uh, other types of fat that brings insulin resistance. So there's all sorts of stuff at play. Um, and then there's a note that says the systemic effects are the same. You have high blood sugars, you have problems with your blood vessels, with vision, um, so that's the same. It's just that the, the diagnosis here is usually involves a very, very um, extreme phenotype. So extremely high blood sugar, extreme thirst, whereas this one, the onset is usually much more <coughs> gradual. A quick look at what insulin does. You'll get this in much more detail in 110C, or may have had it in 101 if you took that before. So insulin is made in the pancreas. The pancreas is this kind of soft tissue that wraps itself around your stomach. And in the old days, we used to think that it was just that, a little pillow for your stomach to rest on. But it actually does a lot. There's digestive enzymes coming from the pancreas. There's juices coming from the pancreas that neutralize stomach acid. And then those tissues make up about 90% of the whole pancreas, right? So we have um, the gut, and we have acinar cells, acinar cells making enzymes, the gut making the neutralizing agents. And then sprinkled in between are those little islands of endocrine tissue. And we talked about uh, endocrine versus um, neural signaling. And if you remember, endocrine signaling, you use the bloodstream, right? So these cells are gonna send their secretions into the blood, whereas all the other parts of the pancreas is gonna send its secretions into um, the gut to mix with the food, to help digest, right? So the pancreas helps digest food, and then as the food is taken up, it also signals for your cells of your body through different mechanisms to go ahead and take up all these nutrients. There's a couple main cell types in the pancreatic islets. This is a picture of a mouse islet. Our islets are slightly differently organized, but we have the same cell types in them. <coughs> Beta cells make insulin and secrete that. Alpha cells make glucagon, and glucagon is a hormone that counteracts insulin. It tells some cells of your body to release glucose, like the liver. So that one would be active if you're really running low. If you haven't eaten for a while, then the alpha cells become active. They make glucagon, they secrete it, and then that raises your blood sugars again. Delta cells, our lab is really interested in, they secrete somatostatin. Somatostatin acts through a GPCR, the alpha I couple, and so it tends to inhibit other cells. And we think that what it does here is it inhibits both alpha and beta cells to have more finely tuned hormone secretion. You can imagine if you're pouring insulin into the system and the sugars are responding by dropping, you need to stop in time when you drop too low, right? And we think that glucagon, somatostatin is kind of performing that role of making sure that alpha and beta cells stop what they do in time to not <coughs> overshoot. So the the main idea is listed here. If blood sugar levels rise, that's a signal for the beta cells to go ahead and activate and secrete insulin into circulation. Insulin in circulation then tells the cells of your body, these would be uh, muscle cells, fat cells, uh, and also the liver gets a signal. All cells of your body respond, but fat, muscle, and liver really are the biggest contributor to getting rid of this glucose. If you were to drive that too long, or if you don't eat something for a while, and your blood glucose drops, that's a signal for the beta cells to stop sending insulin into secretion so that we don't overshoot. <coughs> and the alpha cells would respond in right the opposite manner. They would stop their hormone if glucose rises, and they would start their hormone if glucose falls. So they're kind of the, the yin and yang of blood glucose. So now we have insulin in circulation. How is that going to tell my cells to go ahead and take up glucose? They do this through um, this mechanism where here's the cell surface. Here's the outside of the cell where glucose is. 
And here's the inside of the cell where we want glucose to be. Glucose is pretty large, right? So we can't transport that over the cell membrane by diffusion very well. That would be way too slow. So we have these transporters that insert themselves in the membrane of cells. They're not always there. So they come down from the cell surface and they're presented back on the cell surface as the body needs it. So if insulin is present, the receptor becomes activated, does some cell signaling, which results in this little vesicle with these transporters situated in the membrane, fusing with the plasma membrane, and now we have those transporters sitting on the outside of the cell. The glucose levels drop, and we don't want to drop too low, then the insulin signal disappears, this pathway is not promoted anymore, and so these glucose transporters are back taken up into the cell where they cannot transfer glucose because they're not touching the glucose that's sitting in circulation. <coughs> so do you guys think that this mechanism is true for all cells of our body? Do beta cells have this kind of glucose transporter? Probably no. But why would that not make sense for beta cells to work this way? Okay, well let's let's take a minute and talk about that and then we'll come back. Why did beta cells not use this mechanism of bringing a transporter to the membrane when glucose is high? Right? That's when they have to be active. What's the difference between them? Why, why, why don't all cells eat that beta cell? Or why don't she said that. She said, why wouldn't beta cells work like this? Any ideas? Or something like that. How would this work for a beta cell? Would this work for a beta cell? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beta cells have the same Right, so who's going to give the insulin to the beta cell, right? Yeah. So indeed, the beta cells are the ones sending out this signal. So if they have to wait for that signal before they can take the glucose to make the signal, it makes no sense. So beta cells actually have a glucose transporter that's always there, um, but it's a little less efficient than this one. And so that means as glucose levels rise, enough glucose comes in through that transporter for the beta cell to turn that into a signal that says, ah, time for insulin secretion. So the beta cell glucose transporter is constitutive, always at the membrane. But wait, there's more. Uh, oh, and this one I was actually going to write out because there's all these terms in there that sound the same but that mean very different things. So insulin doesn't just affect sugars, right? That's the top part there. Carbohydrate metabolism is affected, but it also helps with um, storage of glucose as fat, and so it's involved in fat metabolism. And there's a couple of terms on here that I wanted to write out. Glycogenesis. And then there was um, glycogenesis. So there's two genesis is there where we are making stuff.
Okay, so here we make things. Where lysis usually involves breaking things. So we produce this. Pa, right? Yeah, Pa. Yeah. And the other one. So here we are making glycogen, and glycogen is the storage form of glucose formation. So that's what we do to store glucose in our bodies. So glycogenesis, so insulin tells the liver to, to store glucose in this form of glycogen. So it tells the liver and muscle to take glucose up and store it as glycogen because that's kind of our animal starch, right? The proper way to store glucose. It inhibits liver and muscle glycogenolysis, what a word. So this is the breakdown of glycogen. And that's what happens if glucose is too low. We dip into our stores. We don't want to do that in the presence of insulin because insulin is a signal that glucose is already high, right? So now we want to inhibit the breakdown of glycogen. So we inhibit the liver and muscle from breaking apart this glycogen back into the individual molecules of glucose. And then the liver, this is our main storage site for glucose, and it also is able to take other components and make it into glucose. Because glucose, there was this one tissue in our body that needs glucose a lot, that really heavily relies on it, and that's our brain, right? So if the brain doesn't see glucose, you're gonna pass out and be very unhappy. So we have this mechanism in place to make new glucose out of other things. acids and other components. So now we're using other things that we've taken in through our food and we're making glucose out of it. Uh, we don't need to do that because in the presence of insulin, there's already a lot of glucose floating around. So that's why insulin inhibits that process from going on. So if insulin goes up, blood glucose goes down. Similar for fat metabolism, it promotes the uptake of nutrients and to store them. Insulin is really the signal that tells your body, we're flush with stuff, just store it for later. Um, and so are there words here that we need to talk about? Uh, lipolysis would be the breakdown of stored fats, right? So we want to inhibit that because we have a lot of nutrients. Uh, and same for protein, we're going to um, build our cells up, make them grow. So if insulin is there, all the nutrients in your blood are going to go down. This slide is awfully busy, and I just put it there to show you that insulin is very diverse, right? See this pathway, we talked about this in the cell cycle, um, that kinase pathway gets activated so cells can start to proliferate. AKT, that was one of those um, kinases that many people were trying to inhibit to treat cancer because it um, is a growth factor to make cells grow bigger, um, but it's also a pro-survival factor, right? This one was the guy that was phosphorylating bad and um, keeping it away from BCL so that BCL can still prevent apoptosis. So insulin turns on all these intracellular signaling pathways. Um, basically, what I want you to remember is that insulin has many diverse actions. And you can see that having a lot of insulin present all the time can be helpful for cancer cells, right? 
So diabetes is also associated with an increase in certain types of cancer because they can have this extra growth factor uh, mitogen signaling that helps them grow. So um, this one is just FYI, don't memorize. All right, a little bit more on type two versus type one. So type one, because um, this used to be called juvenile diabetes because it's most often diagnosed in children. Um, it's an autoimmune disorder where your beta cells are destroyed. When you are diagnosed with it, it's often over the course of a few weeks that you get these symptoms of thirst and lethargy, you're just really tired, um, you're peeing a lot, you can't seem to get enough liquid in. Um, this is a little exaggerated. We now know that some cells remain that are still trying to produce insulin, but it's by far not enough. So if you don't get your insulin through injections, then you are going to die. There's really nothing else for it. And we see the price of insulin skyrocketing in recent years. So there's really some progress to be made in trying to make um, having diabetes more affordable for people because insulin doesn't have to be as expensive as it is. Here's this thing, ketones. Ketones, ketonic acids, those are the only other fuel source that your brain might accept. So if you have diabetes and you don't have insulin and your blood glucose levels are super, super high, the cells in your body don't know that. Right? They don't see that there's all this glucose there because they don't see the insulin that's telling them that it's there. By themselves, they don't know this. So the brain doesn't know this, the body doesn't know this, and the body starts making this ketones, ketone bodies. Um, that can serve as food for the brain, but they're also acids, so they're going to lower the pH of your blood, and that is not good for you. If you produce too much of this, you can go into diabetic ketoacidosis, go into a coma, and you die. Right? This is serious business. Um, yeah, so our friend was admitted to hospital with diabetic ketoacidosis, blood pH was too low, sugar was too high, insulin wasn't working, and it turned out that the pump that she was using to put the insulin in was at fault. So it took them four days to figure it out. There's some genes that might make it more likely that you have type 1 diabetes later in life. If you have an identical twin that gets type 1 diabetes, and you have a 30% chance of getting it, whereas the overall population only has a 1% chance. Um, but many people with type 1 diabetes, there's nobody else in their family that has it. And we really don't know where the rest of this disease cause comes from. Um, the big thing to remember is that it, there's nothing we can do to prevent it at this point. And the video that I put down there, and I'm not going to play it because I know I'll cry. It's all these parents remembering what it was like when their children were diagnosed. And it's really, it's a life-changing event. Type 2 diabetes. This is the one that we are most familiar with as a society. It comes on much more mildly. This is when people over time, you know, they gain a little weight, they exercise less, they want to try and get their promotion, do all the desk work. Um, kids, it really does it to you, I have to say. Um, so, but over time, you kind of slip towards this, this um, state where you are not using all the energy that you are taking in your body is making a lot of insulin to get rid of all these nutrients that are floating around. Um, and at some point, the cells of your body become resistant. They stop the expression of the receptor. They stop listening. This means that the beta cells will have to work harder. They try to just make more insulin to compensate. And for a while, that works. And so you won't really see much, but you will already be walking around with very high insulin levels. Um, so it takes a while. Before this really turns into diabetes, your body really tries to compensate for a while. Um, but now, because we're all moving less and eating a lot, that age of diagnosis is dropping because so many of us are carrying this extra weight around for longer. 
A uh, lot of research is going on to say that um, there is quite a bit of genetics involved here. And probably this has to do with small changes. If some gene isn't working optimally for you, it might increase your risk a little bit. And then you have a gene in a different pathway. Maybe the insulin receptor that you have isn't as great as some of the other insulin receptor isoforms that are out there. And together, all these little risks can determine that you might have a five or tenfold higher risk than the average person in the population of getting type 2 diabetes. Doesn't mean you have to get it, but it means it's more likely to get it if you go down this path with less exercise and more uh, nutrient intake. Right, so here they say um, that the twins, um, there's 40% concordance, meaning if one of the twins gets it, the other one will also get it. I always feel like this is hard to say because it's likely that they were raised in the same household, right? So have been exposed to the same eating patterns. So if we list those out, as you age and you carry around all this extra weight longer, that means that increasing age um, makes you more likely to get type 2 diabetes. If you are obese, especially in the belly area, that fat is particularly bad for the insulin resistance. Um, being obese as a woman is riskier than being obese as a man, apparently. So unfair with that quality statement. I go to the gym and I work out and I work really hard and nothing seems to happen and my friend shows up twice and you're like, I'm more than I can. <laughs> Something about you and our hormones will probably do. Um, we are not active. We already know this. Uh, if you have a family history of diabetes, this includes all these things, right? Genetics, the way you live. Um, ethnicity plays a role. Some um, populations are just more prone to getting it. High blood pressure, this also is a cause. It has to do with um, the blood vessels not working very well. High cholesterol is related to taking in a lot of nutrients. And this too, if you are pregnant and they find out that during the pregnancy when you carry around this baby in the extra weight, if then you develop type 2 diabetes-like symptoms, then it's much more likely that later on when you carry around the extra weight from just gaining weight, that your body won't be able to cover it, right? It's kind of an indicator that your body is probably not good to um, support all this extra weight. Yes? So what about the, the baby when you're pregnant and you have this extra diabetes? Does the baby have a higher risk of getting diabetes? So she's asking if the baby has a higher risk of diabetes if it was exposed to high blood glucose levels in the womb, right? It does have major effects on the baby, and I do think that that carries forward. And we might um, think about that in the concept of tomorrow's lectures, where what you experience can kind of mark you for your later life experiences, for sure. Um, what we often see, if the diabetes is not controlled, then your glucose goes up. Insulin goes up, and insulin is a growth factor, so these babies come out big. And that's also why I want to monitor the moms to make sure that the babies don't grow too big to be born naturally. Um, this just goes into the details of BMI. Uh, if you look yourself up. Um, but so if you do that and you realize that you really care for people that are in this area, try to stay away from there. Don't go there. Um, I had a student who was uh, in our class, and he said that he actually was up there, and he manages to lose it, which is awesome, because if you're at our age and already up there, that's really not a healthy starting point. We had people diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at age 3. Right? That's sad. Just be, and you can tell that they, they fit the general body type that we are trying to try to. All right, insulin resistance, we kind of went over this already, but it results in a decreased uptake of glucose. Um, it can have different causes. Uh, basically, the idea is that your body doesn't recognize the fact that there is all this insulin present. So there's high glucose, insulin is high, but your body isn't taking it up. The main factor that determines this resistance is really obesity. 
Here's another graph that is there for your information. But lipotoxicity, if you are obese, lots of lipids circulating, that can have a negative effect. You don't need to know how, but just remember that these are some of the things that are causing the insulin resistance. Uh, you can imagine here hyperglycemia, high glucose all the time, high insulin all the time, those cells are going to stop responding. And so this is what normally takes place, and by the time you get here, that's when you really go see the doctor. But there's all this pathways going on before you realize that you may be have diabetes. So the genes that you were born with and that you can't change give you some risk factor, and then what you do with your life adds on to there. And if those all work together in the, the correct way, we become insulin resistant. This means the body needs more insulin to respond. So the beta cells, which are really hard working cells, they start making more insulin. And so you won't see it in your blood sugars. But then at some point, the beta cells are working so hard they try to make so much insulin, there's so much damage to them because they have all this insulin that doesn't properly hold that they need to get rid of and they're overworked because they are asked to make so much insulin. They start to fail. Um, we don't think that they die, but we think that they de-differentiate, that they lose the capacity to maintain um, being a beta cell. So now we have a high demand for insulin because of the resistance but the beta cells are dying no longer at making enough. And so now you start to see that it takes you longer to get rid of some glucose that you take in. And this um, carries on because the remaining beta cells really try, but more of them fail. And then at some point you get into diabetes. And many of the diabetes medications, ironically, are trying to tell the beta cells to once more work even harder. So many of those initially will work, but over time, people that have type 2 diabetes will also start using insulin because their beta cells are just no longer functional at all. This is a slide that shows you a picture of a beta cell. And it tells you a beta cell can see glucose and take it in, and then it breaks it down through glycolysis and makes it into ATP, right? Glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, we talked about that earlier. This ATP, if that rises, that causes the closure of a potassium channel. Now the membrane depolarizes. Are the lectures coming back to you already? That means that calcium channels open and calcium can come into the cell and that's the signal for those insulin granules, those little vesicles with insulin that are waiting there to be secreted but that are not secreted because they're in the regulated secretory pathway. They now fuse with the cell membrane and are secreted. These genes here are all involved somehow in this process of building a proper beta cell. And having one copy of these genes mutated already means that the beta cell is so dysfunctional that you get into an elevated blood glucose. If you don't have PDX1 and all enzymes, no hormones, no nothing. Um, most of these are transcription factors, except for this guy. This is an enzyme that really is the rate limiting step in this whole process. So working at its best, it's able to perform properly, but if you break one copy, you already slow down the pathway so much that the beta cell is not able to secrete enough insulin. And these we call MODIs because they're usually pretty mild, so it looks like the diabetes that we normally see in older people, mature people, um, but we see it in young people because they obviously lack these genes or have mutations from when they are born. So I just wanted to show you this because this is another type of diabetes, purely genetic uh, and often fairly mild. Uh, 
This is a side-by-side -side putting together some of the data that we talked about before. Type 1 versus type 2. <clears throat> Fewer cases, younger cases. Um, can't really help getting it. More cases, older cases. Uh, even though there's a lot of genes involved, this really has to do with our lifestyle. And this one is the repeat from the beginning. All these extra glucoses are preventing your blood vessels from working properly, and that really causes damage to all the tissues that they normally supply to the hospital. You are?